Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I can't be there to see you in person, but uh, this is the best we can do and we make the best of it. I'd like to talk to you today about the rising ethical storm in open source. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Coraline, and I'm a big time troublemaker. I fought for codes of conduct at tech conferences in the early 20 teens. I, I created Contributor Covenant, the first and most popular code of conduct in the world for open source communities in 2014. In 2016, I was honored with the Ruby Hero Award. I spoke at the United Nations Forum on Business and Human Rights, on human rights abuses by tech companies. I authored the Hippocratic License, an ethical open source license based on the UN De Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 2019. And last year, I founded the Organization for Ethical Source. I want to tell you a story. In the 1960s, amidst growing tensions between the US and the Soviet Union, a computer scientist published a short piece that he called The Parable of the Locksmith. And this is my retelling. One day, a mysterious stranger walked into a locksmith shop and he came with a proposition. I have a job that needs doing and it requires someone with your highly specialized skills, he said. I've done my research and you are one of the smartest and most capable locksmiths in the city. The locksmith felt very flattered, and more than a little intrigued. The man continued, I want to hire you to open a certain safe. Never mind whose safe it is. That's none of your concern. Just do the job I hire you to do, and I will make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. The locksmith was excited at the proposition of a lucrative job like this, but he was also a bit nervous about not knowing who the safe belonged to. It seemed suspicious. But the stranger went on. There are also certain conditions you'll have to agree to. I'm going to blindfold you and take your phone away before bringing you to the safe's location. And you can never tell anyone that I hired you. This struck the locksmith as very odd, but he thought about what the man had said about making him rich. He felt like he'd struggled all his life and was never properly rewarded for the hard work he put in day after day. The stranger said, you can have all the tools you need to do the job, the very best tools. I will spare no expense. Take your time. I'll be back for your answer tomorrow. Despite his hesitation about the nature of the job, the locksmith spent all night thinking about his crummy apartment his shabby furniture, his young daughter's dream of one day going to college. From the beginning, he and his family had learned to scrimp and save just to get by. And anyway, he thought to himself, if I don't take this job, he'll just go to another locksmith, the second best locksmith. The next day, when the stranger returned, the locksmith agreed to take the job. After multiple blindfolded trips to and from the unknown location, the locksmith finally cracked the safe. He wasn't allowed to see what was inside. The stranger blindfolded him again as soon as the lock clicked open. But true to his word, the stranger made the locksmith exceedingly rich. We're going to come back to this parable and find out what happened when the safe was opened in just a few minutes. First, I want to tell you another story. This is an HP LaserJet, and it was one of the first laser printers on the market back in 1983. At the time, a man named Richard Stallman, who was working at an AI lab at Xerox, had access to one of these printers in his lab, and it was cutting edge technology. The only problem with the printer was that it constantly jammed. The lab had time sharing software, so you could book time for various resources, including a printer. But if you set aside and schedule 30 minutes for the printer, only to let, only to have the printer jam three minutes in, and you go back to get your printout, you'd be upset. So Stallman and his coworkers decided to change the printer driver so that it would report jams back to the time sharing software, and users could be notified about jams. But the software was proprietary, and HP wouldn't share the source code. Stallman found out that a colleague at MIT had source code, but that person had signed a non-disclosure agreement and couldn't share it. Stallman got really angry, not just about the printer, 
but about the fact that the world was shifting toward proprietary software. And this incident with the printer would lead to the creation of the free software movement. In the mid to late 90s, when the world discovered the internet, free software became a popular choice for web servers. Apache became the most used web server software. Many systems were based on a stack called LAMP, the Linux kernel at the base, Apache providing web services, MySQL database for storage, and Perl or PHP for providing dynamic pages. All were open source technologies. Christine Peterson had coined the term open source in 1988, 1998. In that same year, the open, open source definition was penned by Bruce Perrins. Nine months later, the open source initiative was founded to promote the use of open source software. Over the past 20 years, the open source community has come to thrive, enjoying wild success and permanently changing the technology landscape. But the world has also changed in the past two decades. Around the globe, we're seeing technology being leveraged to commit human rights abuses at an alarming scale. And the technology powering some of these abuses includes free and open source software. Open source today is playing an increasing role in mass surveillance, anti-immigrant violence, protester suppression, racially biased policing, the development and use of cruel and inhumane weapons. And open source's complicity isn't a bug, it's a feature. This is by design. The open source definition specifically allows for the use of any software for any purpose, including for evil. And they say giving everyone freedom means giving evil people freedom too. But under what other circumstances in human society do we grant complete freedom to evil people? Why is it different with software? There's an increasing discussion among developers about our ethical responsibilities as creators. The debates are heated and the media has been paying attention. The fundamental question seems to be, are we responsible for how the technologies we develop are used? And a lot of us are beginning to accept that, yes, our work in open source is contributing to human rights violations in the U.S. and around the world. We're horrified by what's happening, and we're horrified at the thought that we may be contributing to it. We feel powerless. We want to find some way to do the right thing. The conversation about ethics in technology and computer science is not new. It's been going on in our field since before there was any such thing as software. I want to introduce you to a man named Edmund Berkeley. He was one of the most important pioneers of ethics in computer science in the 20th century. Yet almost no one knows who he is. He got to start working on computers work, um, with the Navy during World War II. He published the world's first computer magazine, and he was among the first to propose the idea of a personal computer. Berkeley co-founded the Association for Computing Machinery in 1947. The organization's charter is to foster the open interchange of information and promote the highest professional and ethical standards. Berkeley sat on the Committee on the Social Responsibility of Computer Scientists, which published an historic and foundational report in 1958 on the ethical obligations of technologists. And the findings of the report boil down into four simple statements. First, that we cannot rightly ignore our social responsibilities. Secondly, that our social responsibilities can't be delegated to others. Third, that we cannot rightly neglect to think about how our special role can benefit or harm society. In other words, we have to consider how our special capacities can help to advance socially desirable applications and prevent undesirable outcomes. And finally, we cannot avoid deciding between conflicting responsibilities. We must think how to choose. The report went on to say that when one reflects upon the great forces that we computer people are associated with, it is no longer difficult to grasp and perhaps to accept our heavier than average share of responsibility. 
The committee believed that given the power and potential of computers, ethical considerations were paramount. The study concluded the scientist credo, knowledge for knowledge's sake, easily comes into conflict with their ethical responsibilities. Given in human society in our century, and the ethical value system that we use in this century, we can label some classes of work as obviously socially desirable, and other classes of work as obviously socially undesirable, even while we acknowledge that there's a large middle ground which cannot be clearly classified. And it was Edmund Berkeley who wrote the parable of the locksmith. And remember, it was the height of the Cold War when he wrote it. The parable ends with this. A week later, the now retired locksmith saw a news headline about the theft of top, top secret military schematics. And soon after that, the stranger himself appeared on the world stage, declaring himself master of all nations and backed by the overwhelming threat of a devastating stolen superweapon. So Berkeley and Kurt just asked some questions. First of all, did the locksmith do what was right? And he contended that the locksmith had a responsibility to determine the motives of the stranger, determine if he was a criminal before agreeing to work with them. So no, the locksmith did not do what was right. Berkeley concluded that the computer scientist does not have the right to shut their eyes in regard to their responsibilities any more than the locksmith did. And he called on his colleagues to shoulder their proper social responsibilities. And he was largely ignored. Fast forward about a decade. It's 1972 and the Vietnam War is raging. Berkeley and his colleague Franz Alt have been invited to address the Association of Computing Machinery at a special dinner honoring them as founders on its 25th anniversary. Franz Alt's topic was reflections and Ed Berkeley was to follow with the talk on the future looking topic of horizons. Alt's talk was celebratory and provided a retrospective on the advances in computer engineering and computer science since World War II. But Berkeley's speech took on a distinctly different tone. He told the audience that anyone who was working to further the unethical uses of computers, including the use of computers in developing weapons technology, should quit their jobs. He called out members of the audience by name. Many of his colleagues were so upset by his comments that they stood up and walked out in the middle of the speech. Admiral Grace Hopper was among those who stood up and left. Berkeley concluded his speech by saying that it was a gross neglect of responsibility that computer scientists were not considering their impact in terms of societal benefit or societal harm. Scientists in other fields faced ethical dilemmas like these too. World War I saw the first large-scale deployment of chemical weapons and the horrors of death by poison gas and repercussions throughout the chemical production world. Between the 1918 armistice and 1933, international conferences were held to try and limit or abolish chemical weapons. And to this day, no chemical manufacturer in the US will, pro will produce a solution that's used for death by lethal injection. Atomic scientists, after seeing the inhumane devastation of the atomic bomb at the end of World War II, these scientists actively sought to limit or eliminate the bomb's threat to human civilization. The bulletin of the atomic scientists became the voice for the ethical responsibilities of physicists. And the Doomsday Clock Project was launched, continuing to this day as a reminder of the danger of doing nothing. Nazi Germany used technology and services provided by IBM in their efforts to identify and destroy the country's Jewish and Romani minorities. The Nazis even shipped IBM punch cards on the trains to concentration camps. So it's widely accepted that IBM was complicit in the Holocaust. And how did the computer science community deal with it, its ethical conflict? The realization that they might be complicit and genocide and other atrocities. They got up and left the room. And that shirking of responsibility is pervasive in the world today too. 
technology companies routinely rely on technology, including open source technology, to provide services to organizations like ICE. How would we feel about the complicity of IBM and the Holocaust if their punch card system had been released under the MIT license? Because that is exactly the situation we're facing today. In 1998, when the open source definition was penned, the greatest evil conceivable by technologists was the market domination of the Microsoft operating system in its Internet Explorer browser. The founding thinkers responsible for free and open software clearly understood the impact of technology on society, but rather than using an ethical framing, they choose to focus on technology in intellectual property terms and centered on the idea of software freedom. In 2021, we face threats much greater than the market domination of a web browser. We're in an age where corporations and governments are carrying out programs of mass surveillance, suppressing legitimate political protest, and perpetrating state-sanctioned violence and even genocide. In the US, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, has been separating children from their parents at our border for years, even before Trump, and putting immigrants and asylum seekers in cages without reliable legal assist assistance or due process, let alone medical care. An estimated 40,000 people are currently in ICE custody, and there have been hundreds of documented deaths in these concentration camps, most of them due to gross, ne gross neglect. And U.S. tech companies are collecting billions of dollars in contracts to support ISIS programs of terror. So what does that have to do with open source? Well, let's take a well-known example, Palantir Technologies, which is a software company co-founded by top Trump advisor Peter Thiel, collects tens of millions of dollars from ICE every year. Palantir has over 200 projects hosted on GitHub, and these projects in turn rely on thousands of open source projects. Every dependency in use by ICE and Palantir contributes to human rights violations. Palantir is explicitly leveraging open source to aid and abet ICE's human rights violations. And it's not alone. The technology historian Melvin Krenzberg famously wrote in the first of his six laws of technology, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And Professor Leela Green, in her important book, Framing Technology, Society, Choice, and Change, wrote that when technology was perceived as being outside society, it made sense to talk about it as neutral. But the idea fails to take into account that culture is not fixed and society is dynamic. When technology is implicated in social processes, there's nothing neutral about it. In 1999, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan announced the United Nations Global Compact. It's a pact to encourage businesses worldwide to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies. It's the world's largest corporate responsibility initiative and has over 13,000 participants and stakeholders in 170 countries. Its very first section deals with human rights and states that businesses should support and respect the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights, and that businesses must make sure that they are not complicit in human rights abuses. Complicity is defined in two different contexts. The first is providing goods or services that a company knows will be used to carry out human rights abuses. And the second is when a company benefits from human rights abuses, even if it didn't positively assist or cause them. Many large tech companies have been profiting happily from human rights abuses for years. And I've been calling for those who have the safety and privilege to do so, to accept their ethical responsibilities and either organize for change in these companies, or as Berkeley said, quit their jobs. This includes tech workers at Amazon, at Microsoft, at GitHub, at Salesforce, at Cisco, and at many other companies. Technology companies like these all profit from human rights abuses 
And according to the UN definition, these companies are complicit. And they're using our software. Are we going to get up and leave the room again? Or are we going to accept our ethical responsibility for how our work is being used? In 2014, the Ruby community came together and demonstrated its commitment to the values of diversity and inclusion by embracing Contributor Covenant. Today, I'm asking the Ruby community to once again take a stand. I don't expect you all to relicense your gems under an ethical license, but I do expect you to come together as a community and reflect on our shared values how we can center them in everything we do, how we can accept our outsized responsibilities as technologists, how we can prevent our work from being used to cause harm. Because we face a much bigger ethical challenge than the threat of proprietary software. Stallman wanted a printer driver. We wanna keep our work from being used by fascists. That's what this revolution is about. And it's my hope that just like we did seven years ago, the Ruby community will stand up and lead the way. It's time for us to go beyond nice. Frankly, I'm sick of nice. Nice is meaningless if we're not just. Nice is meaningless if we're not equitable. We can't keep using nice as a shield that we hide behind, ignoring our impact. I founded the Ethical Source Movement to empower us to take responsibility for this impact to find ways to promote justice and equity in our work, to ensure that our work is being used for social good, to prevent the harm caused by pretending that technology is neutral. And I hope you'll join me. Thank you for listening.